spectrum, a wireless pulse, a sine wave with that, a resonance, and form, and, and I will try to make these things somewhat clearer for you. So we're going to be talking about uh, the time and frequency domains. Those are concepts that you will hear during the coming days, uh, and what do they mean? Uh, we'll look at the spectrum of a sound, uh, we'll consider the harmonic series of partial tones, and we will talk about resonances, and particularly the resonances in the vocal tract. And uh, toward the end, we will see how performance might be a singer's best friend. So the time domain, let's have a look at that. We will have a look at the oscilloscope, and I'm going to branch out now and have a look at an oscilloscope, like so. And with this God be willing, there we go. Oh, yeah. So this is a nice little freeware that you can get from a colleague of mine. Uh, and we're going to do a thing here, we're going to stretch this uh, because we don't really need the top frequencies. Now we have frequency on the horizontal axis going from 0 hertz to some 10,000 or so. That's the frequency domain at the bottom and at the top we have the time domain. Now what does that mean? Well. Uh, if I freeze this, uh, there we go. Stop it. Uh, okay. Now, up here we have a time axis. I don't know if you can make out, but it says milliseconds there, which means thousands of a second. So it's only two thousandths of a second. And you can see that there is something going on here. It's a complicated waveform but it repeats, more or less. Can you see? Okay, and what is this repeating and why is it so complicated? And that's what we'll be talking about for, for a while now. So, uh, the duration of this cycle that we can see here is about from 15 to 27 milliseconds, and if we do a quick little thing in our head, that gives us about 140 hertz, and so that was the frequency at which I was producing the sound. Let's see what this means in the frequency domain. Well, I'm going to have to stretch this a bit more so that we can make out the bottom end. Let's first um, not go to this very complicated sound, let's go to a somewhat simpler sound. Now, what's that? Anybody recognize this particular wave shape? Sine, sine wave, is it? And what, what is special about the sine wave? Well, it's the, actually the simplest possible periodic wave, if you will. Uh, and it's really just, uh, if you imagine a circle, and you take a circle and you spin it out along a time axis, it's the projection of a circle on a time axis. And it's difficult to imagine anything simpler than the circle, or well, straight line, I suppose. Anyway, now this means that these, part, these things, cycles repeat with some sort of frequency here, and we can see that from it's about one and a half milliseconds. And let's see what does that mean. Well, we see this peak here. If we look at the frequency axis, uh, it comes down to about 600 hertz. I don't know if you can see that. Is this? text large enough? Here. Okay, so let's have a look again. <coughs> Alright, so there's some other things going on here. There's a bit of noise uh, what we call the noise floor down there, but in principle this display magically shows us not only how what frequency the sine wave has, but also how strong it is at the same time. And we can actually see that at twice that frequency there's a hint of an overtone. Um, but whistling is in fact incredibly useful because it is very close to a sine wave. And when we do a frequency transform, a spectroscope like this one, the magic is that it can show many sine waves at the same time. 
so you're going to have to help me. Uh, can you all whistle a little bit and see what happens? Oh, if only I were a composer. <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that if you see, any, if, if ever you see a kind of a spike in the spectrum, it represents a sine wave. And uh, now what we will do is we will do a little exercise where we will bring in a, a more well-controlled sine wave. I'm going to do a little. Uh, Thing like that. Can you hear the, the sine wave there? Some of you will have seen this little software. It's a vowel synthesizer, which is very useful. It's called Mother, and it's also a freeware. And we'll pull those down for the oops. Okay. So what we have here? Well, this is a, what's called an additive synthesizer. So it builds complex sounds by adding sine waves together. And what does it look like? It looks like that. Okay, now if we uh, change the frequency, this uh, oscilloscope doesn't have a trigger, I'm afraid, so uh, we have to uh, see it drift a little bit. And that was, was it 59.6? Yes, very good. Okay, now we see the spectrum with a single sine wave down there, and if you tweak the analysis, you can make this spike narrow or broad, depending on what you want to achieve. Now, if you notice here, I can manipulate the strength of that one and add another sine wave at the same time. And I can keep adding sine waves. Let's, this is going a bit fast, hang on. So there's one sine wave, and now I add another one, which is only half as strong, so it's six decibels softer, and a third, which sounds like a fifth, what I mean is the third harmonic sounds like a fifth musically, and then the second octave, and the major fifth. Maybe you can see where this is going. If I add lots of harmonics like that, now we suddenly have a different kind of a waveform. And it seems I've forgotten one there. <laughs> Sorry. Which is nice because. Uh, let's see, where's the level? We don't need it that time. Okay. Now we have a completely different waveform, uh, and in fact, uh, a very clever French mathematician by the name of Fourier in the early 1800s, believe it or not, he showed that if you have a periodic waveform of any shape, you could always describe it as a sum of sine waves in, with varying strengths and, and varying phase relationships. And that includes voice sound. So we can actually make a voice sound out of this, uh, but uh, we're not quite there yet. Now we've been heard talking about formation and how the vocal folds vibrate, uh, but that is not enough. Uh, if, uh, so if we have a, a, a pair of vocal folds, it would sound something like that. If you were to cut my head off just above the vocal folds and ask me to say ah, it wouldn't sound like ah, it would sound like you need a, a resonating vocal track afterwards to do something to that sound or some such so <clears throat> what we can do is we can apply uh, a vocal tract or rather the resonances of a vocal tract and see what happens so we'll run that again. That's a terrible, annoying noise, isn't it? Let's put a first resonance. There we go, 500. And now I'm adding, uh, let's see if we can manipulate those two resonant frequencies. So now 
I put the frequency of the first resonance on the horizontal axis and the second on the vertical axis. It's sort of vaguely reminiscent of a vowel, but the spectrum, as you can see, is very, very meager. It has only a few low partials. So, but let's put in a few more more resonances like that. Still sounds very boring, but maybe not because of the resonances, okay? actually holds uh, what happens with And if I open the pipe at the other end, 
then it has two open ends, which changes the resonant frequency of it. Um, and if we were to look at the spectrum of that, you can see that there, are, there tends to be, uh, you can see three sine waves more or less jumping up. Um, and those represent the first three resonances, but this is not a very clear way of showing it, so I'm going to do a little tricky thing here. I'm going to play, I'm going to do a frequency response analysis on this tube, if God be willing. So I've got a pair of headphones here, and we're going to park that for the time being. And we're going to run this other little software instead. There, here we are. So if I do, for example, So you may ask, all right, if we're hearing all these sine waves, uh, why don't they sound like a chord? Uh, why don't we hear these sine waves? Well, that's because they're all in phase. And so the brain realizes that, oh, there are lots of sine waves in phase. They probably come from the same place. But if you have two voices, uh, they're not in phase, and you can actually separate the sound of two voices. Uh, after that, it gets a bit harder. If you try to play three or four voices, it starts to fuse and you can't really uh, separate them. Okay, but we can trick the brain a little bit by emphasizing a sine wave in particular. So if I go, there in some sense uh, and together they build a complicated sound such as the vowel. It turns out that those resonances are very cleverly arranged because the first two resonances are mostly determining the, the vowel color. If I do ooh, ah, eh, e, uh, it's mostly the, the lowest two the change or if you were speaking Swedish it would be the lowest three. Uh, one problem here is, of course, that it's not quite clear uh, exactly where those peaks are. And the trick then is to try to lower the fundamental frequency a lot. So if I go just one impulse, you can almost see the sine waves popping up. But if I go, Uh, 
then these resonant peaks become very clear and deep, right? So, occupational disease. But there you go. So, you will hear, and those resonant peaks are called formants. So, formant is a term for a resonance in the vocal tract. And you will hear that word a lot. And they are very interesting to speakers and singers. Uh, and there are tricks you can do with the formants to make stand out over the orchestra or to make yourself much louder. Uh, and we would not have time to go into that, but uh, there are lots of good books about it. So uh, I hope that was a teaser for those of you who haven't seen this before. And for those who have, uh, I will thank you for your indulgence.